Open your Bibles up to the book of Exodus. We're going to read one verse. Exodus chapter 34. My message this morning is entitled, Our God is a Jealous God. Our God is a Jealous God. Exodus chapter 34. And you want to keep your Bibles open because we're going to be working out of that chapter. And verse 14. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Exodus chapter 34, and this is the Lord speaking. He says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. I want to preach to you today on our God is a jealous God. Holy Father, I pray that you'd move in our hearts today. Lord, again, I'm not looking to preach a great sermon. I'm looking to exalt Jesus Christ. Father, I'm looking to preach the truth. I'm looking to have you anoint the words that would stick to your people's heart like Velcro, that they may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May everything we do redound unto thy glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, I want to speak to you on one of the most little known and the most overlooked divine attributes of God, and that, of course, is his jealousy. His jealousy. You imagine, beloved, God is jealous. Some 30 times in the Bible, the Bible says that our God is a jealous God. Repeatedly, we find God saying this to his people over and over again. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Do you think God was trying to drive home the point? Now, beloved, God's jealousy, unlike man's, does not mean that he is envious and desirous of some characteristic or some quality or some possession of man's that he does not have, but he wants. That's what we want to do. In Scripture, the word jealousy, as it relates or pertains to God, is the word kena. And it means that he is personally resentful. Listen to this. He's personally envious and cannot and will not tolerate any other competitor, any other contender, any other co-rival or challenger to sit on the throne of his people's heart and life is God but him. Now you think about that for a moment. Because a lot of people say they belong to Christ, but there's something other than Christ that's sitting on the throne of their heart, and God says, if that's you, I'm jealous over it. Would you say amen? amen. Now, beloved, the root word of this uh, Hebrew word, kena, literally means this. It means to be inwardly heated, to be inwardly inflamed, to be inwardly burning and boiling and bubbling inside. To inwardly become bright red, beloved, like when a person is upset and they're hot under the collar. And now they get fired up about something. And when they do, you can see their face. You can see it rising, almost like a thermostat. It starts turning bright red. That's exactly what this Hebrew word kana means in the scripture when it relates to God. Would you say amen? And notice in verse 14, beloved, if you would that it not only says that God himself is jealous, but it says that God's name is jealous. Now, King Solomon told us this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, that a good name is better than precious ointment. Now, why is that true? Because we all know that a good name, a good reputation is highly esteemed, and it can take a long time. It can take years of hard work to build, and often just one stupid mistake can uh, ruin it all. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about. I've seen many a preacher fall because he made one egregious, stupid mistake. And it doesn't mean he lost his salvation. It means he, should, he had to step out of the ministry because he did something that he ought not to have done. So, beloved, folks equate having a good name with you being a person honest, who's upright, whose character, uh, who has some character and integrity in their heart. So, for God to introduce himself here as being jealous is highly unusual in Scripture. Why? Because God's character, God's integrity, God's reputation is impeccable. It's beyond dispute as it is. So why should he say his name is also jealous? Now listen to me. I want to explain that to you as we go through the Scriptures. God has revealed himself to us by many names in Scripture. Why? Why does he do it? Again and again, God gives us a different name. Well, beloved, he does it to show us different aspects of his divine nature and attributes and characteristics. For example, God calls himself in the, in, uh, by the name of 
Lord in Scripture. That's all uppercase letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, like we just saw in Psalm 46, 1, hallelujah, Yahovah, praise the Lord. And so he reveals himself as uh, Lord, or Yehovah, to show that he alone is the sovereign and supreme, singular, eternal, self-existent God, who is the uncaused cause and creator and redeemer God of the universe. And so that name, Yehovah, Lord, is used exclusively for him, the sovereign being of the universe. Would you say amen? And God has revealed himself by the name of God. That's capital G, lowercase o-d. That's the Hebrew word Elohim. And that word Elohim is a generic name for God in the scripture. But that word Elohim is also a uniplural noun, meaning this. I have one bunch of grapes, I can have ten grapes in it. There's one Batello family, there's four, seven others. Seven, eight, nine, nine others. Okay. Hey David, I didn't have my guy. <laughs> Okay, so you can see that it's a uniplural noun, Elohim. And so what is God showing us? He's showing us, beloved, that there is one divine being, but there are three persons in the divine Godhead, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that is the Trinity in unity. And that's why, beloved, God said in Genesis 1.26, that us, Elohim, make man in our image showing right from the get-go to the children of Israel that there was more than one person in the Godhead, even though there was only one divine being called God. What would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, that's a mystery uh, of the Scripture, and that's why it's so important the language. Now, he was doing that to show us his divine nature. He was trying to show the children of Israel that he's a triune God. Why? Because the Messiah was going to come, and he was going to be God in the flesh. What would you say amen? Now, beloved, God has revealed himself and called himself by the name Elion, the Most High God. God has called himself by the name Adonai, meaning the Lord, our Sovereign Master. God has called himself by the name Yehovah Jireh, that is, the Lord, our Provider. And Yehovah Elion, the Most High God. And Adonai, our Sovereign Master. And uh, Yehovah Nisai, the Lord, our Banner. And Yehovah Rufika, the Lord our healer, and Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace, beloved, and Jehovah Sakinu, the Lord our righteousness, and Jehovah uh, Mikadishkum, uh, the Lord our sanctifier, and the Lord our shepherd. I know I could go on and on, but many titles God has revealed to us. Is he my shepherd? Yes, he is. Is he my provider? Yes, he is. Is he my strength? Yes, he is. Is he my Lord? Yes, he is. See, God's trying to show us different aspects of his character, of his divine attributes, and of his being. Would you say amen out there? So God gave us all these names of his to reveal to us alone that he's the one and only multifaceted and perfect triune or true living God that man should ever love, worship, and serve. But here in verse 14, God now soberly introduces himself to us with a solemn warning, beloved. He said another name of his is the God who is jealous. It's as if he's saying, yes, I'm a God of love and mercy. Yes, I'm a God of grace. Yes, I'm a God who provides. And yes, I'm a God who gives you peace. And yes, I'm Jehovah, 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 who you. But he said, I'm also a God who is a jealous God. And I'm also a Lord who is a jealous Lord. I'm also an almighty, who's, uh, an almighty uh, God and who's jealous of you. And I'm also a God of anger and judgment and jealousy and wrath too. That's what God is saying. So don't you... Commit spiritual adultery and forsake me for some lesser God who's really no God at all. And when you do that, beloved, God says what you do is you stir up and you provoke him to wrath uh, against you. Because our God is a jealous God. Amen? You know, a husband demands all of his wife's affection and attention, beloved, and vice versa. And that's the way it should be amongst uh, married couples. Well, let's suppose one night a husband comes home after a hard day's work. One night he comes home and he sees his wife going through an old dusty photo album. And there she is sitting all alone by herself and she's kind of reminiscing and smiling away at the pictures and softly and tenderly saying, ooh, ah, mmm. 
as she slowly turns and lingers and hesitantly kind of takes that page and looks back again. And, oh, you know, and the husband looks at that and thinks, you know what? She must be infatuated with me. <laughs> you know what? She must be captivated with some old pictures and memory of us together. So he kind of creeps up to her and she doesn't know it. And he looks over his shoulder and there she is looking at pictures of her old boyfriends and not him. <laughs> Right. <laughs> what? I can just see the spirit of betrayal upon him, the spirit of anger, and the spirit of jealousy. Hey, listen to me now. That's exactly how God feels when we make other gods out of things and put them before him. Would you say amen out there? That's exactly how God feels. He feels betrayed because you and I have been married to him. Now, there's three things I want you to see about God uh, his name being jealous. Our God is a jealous God, I told you. God is jealous over his person. Look what he says in verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, Yahovah, whose name is jealous, is a jealous Elohim. He is a jealous God. Now here God used Moses to supernaturally deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was the superpower of the known world at that time. Now, beloved, think about this. In their 400 years of bondage down in Egypt, the children of Israel had seen their captors regularly and idolatrously worship a virtual pantheon of gods and demigods. Daily, in and out, gods like Ra, the sun god, gods like Allah, the moon god. And by the way, that's where the Muslims got it, from Allah, the moon god. Gods like Horus, the god of the sky and light, which all of the Pharisees claimed to be Horus incarnate. Like Thoth, the god of wisdom and knowledge. Like Seti, the god of the desert and storms. Like Wajet, the cobra, and god of serpent and stealth power. Indeed, beloved, the very royal insignia and symbol of Egyptian might is the cobra. You see it on the mitre of a lot of Pharaoh's heads. So the children of Israel saw the Egyptians worship a literal plethora of false gods like Osis, like Isis, like Mutt. Imagine being a god, I'm worshiping Mutt today. Did you say mud? No, I said Mutt. <laughs> but many other gods, beloved. And consequently, many lost sight down there in Egypt of the one true living God. The God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, beloved. And now they became confused as to which god they should worship. Now some, albeit not all, but some of them ended up joining the worship of these false gods with the Egyptians. But you know, beloved, there was a faithful remnant. Bless God, he always has a faithful remnant. That's that big piece of cloth when you rip out a little bolt, a little piece. See, God has a remnant that he keeps, amen? All the way through the Old Testament, we see that remnant from, uh, from Enoch to Noah Abraham, beloved God, just keeps that remnant going so he could bring the Messiah into the world. Would you say amen? But you see, beloved, this remnant who worshiped the God of Israel, they had not bowed the knee to these false gods. And praise the Lord, beloved, the God of heaven heard their desperate cries for deliverance. And so God sent Moses down to Egypt to be able to deliver them from their Egyptian bondage. And God foreknew this, that when he went down there, the children of Israel were going to ask Moses, they were going to say, Moses, what is the name of this God who sent you to supposedly deliver us? So when the children of Israel ultimately asked Moses this, Moses told them that the name of this great God who sent them to deliver them was this. God said his name was, I am who I am. Can you imagine that, beloved? There's someone that's confident out there. I am who I am. <laughs> okay. That my name is I am who I am, meaning this, that he alone was the living and ever-present God, meaning that he was the infinite and eternal self-existent God, meaning that he was the one and only true God who has ever existed in the dateless, timeless, eternal past, present, and future, beloved. I am who I am, I always was, and I always will be. That's who I am. Would you say amen? That's who sent you down there to Egypt to deliver my people. In other words, Moses was to tell them that the false gods of Egypt were nothing but dead, lifeless deities and idols that were nothing but the work of men's own vain imaginations and hands. God said they had eyes, but they see not. God said they had ears, but they hear not. 
God said they had hands, but they feel not. God said they had a heart, but they do not comprehend. Why? Because they were the works of men's hands, the works of man's veins imaginations. The creature makes the, uh, creates his own God and then he bows down to it and he worships them. And beloved, when you read Romans chapter 1, that's exactly about the judgment of God upon the antediluvian world. That's the people who lived 1625 years before the deluge, the flood. So God told Moses, go and introduce the children of Israel my name. And my name is, I am who I am. But not only that, Moses, I want you to tell you that I am who I am is also a jealous God. My name is also jealous. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, he said that he was the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that they had worshipped, and now he had come to deliver them so they too could worship the one true covenant-keeping God. Now, don't lose me now. I'm going someplace with this. This plane's going to land, I assure you. There is a specific reason I've given you this brief background, beloved, this history lesson, so you can understand something about God's jealousy. Now, I want you to picture this. Contextually, as we read this, the children of Israel had only been delivered out of Egypt for about a month, just 30 days. And now, at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses received the law. Then they saw this great God descend upon it in a fiery cloud of glory. Remember you're reading that? And it says that in shock and awe, they watched the mountain shake and quake and rumble and heave back and forth. And the Bible says they saw pillars and billows of cloud and smoke firing up, going up into the air, sending off the top of the summit. And here's this whole mountain, everything shaking and rattling and rolling. And people are petrified now. They're like this here. They've never seen anything like that. They didn't see any of the gods of Egypt ever do that. But then, beloved, in the midst of that, all of a sudden, they started hearing God's audible voice. It was loud. It was thunderous. It was resonating. The Bible says it was like a horn. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And he gives them the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness or anything than the heaven above and the earth beneath or than the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor worship them. Listen to me now. For I, the Lord thy God, am a what? Jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In other words, what's God saying? God's saying, I am a very jealous God. Would you say amen out there? So don't you just put me in one of those categories of pantheon of gods that you saw down in Egypt. That's what God was saying to them. I'm totally unlike them. So I want you to personally renounce and denounce all the false gods of Egypt and worship me alone as God. Oh, but I ask you, I ask you, what false gods do you have to renounce and denounce in your life? Is it the false god of your money? Is it the false god of your job, your leisure? Is it the false god of your pleasure, perhaps your family, beloved? What is it that you're putting before God? What is it that you're putting before worship or coming to His church? What is it you're putting before serving the Lord? Who and what? Is it this sitting on the throne of your heart and has the top priority in your life? Is it God or is it someone or is it something else, beloved? It's sitting on the throne of your heart. God says, my name is jealous. He says, I'm jealous over my person. I'm jealous over my name. I'm jealous over my reputation. And so he tries to indelibly stamp that on the hearts of the children of Israel. Beloved, who had then nothing but a ragtag bunch of undisciplined and idolatrous slaves. See, they had never seen anything like that. Imagine, beloved, 400 long years. Actually, it was 430 because it includes when, when uh, Jacob went down. And Jacob lived down there about 30 years. So it was 430 years uh, in total. But the fact of the matter is, beloved, could you imagine? He was saying to them, I want you to understand that I'm the one true living creator God, not Ra. I want you to understand that I am the almighty and the everlasting God, a holy, righteous, and just God. I'm the only one that should be worshipped. I'm the only one that should be served. I'm the only one that should be loved above everyone, everything else in your life. Unlike what's going on with the Egyptians, which you just came out of. Now, why did God say that to them? Because God was trying to them. 
And us, by the way, to now live holy, righteous, and godly, moral, spiritual lives as His covenant people because God was jealous for them. Imagine, beloved, God never had done that before. He said, in fact, you'll see as we read it, God said He had never done these kind of marvelous works. Every plague in Egypt, the ten plagues, was leveled against the gods of the Egyptians to show them that they were no gods. And then not only that, He splits the Red Sea. Not only that, He feeds them manna from heaven and quail for 40 years. And not only that, the Bible says their shoes don't wear off, the clothes on their back uh, don't wear out. Not only that, beloved, imagine you've got millions of heads of live rock. You're out in the desert. You feed them. Here's the grass. Where are they going to eat? God says, I'll take care of that. Oh, by the way, Lord, you don't understand. We're thirsty too. We need some water. You need some water? I want you to go over there to Meribah. Moses, speak to that rock. Moses was so fed up with him, the Bible says he hit the rock twice. God says, Moses, for that, for your disobedience, you won't go in and see the promised land. I told you to speak to it, not hit it, because Christ was the rock that followed them. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4, right? So he smote who was following him. He smote the Lord. And because of that, he was prohibited from going into the promised land. But beloved, why did God want them to be jealous, uh, 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 not be jealous of these other gods? Because God did not want them to act in an idolatrous and immoral manner like was allowed under the Egyptian gods. The Egyptian gods, remember, beloved, they didn't worship a statue because they thought that this God was so far away you could never reach him anyways. He was transcendent. But God says, am I a God that's not just far away? Am I not a God who's near? I'm transcendent and I'm what? Imminent. I'm the one that's far away, and I'm close to you, as close as your heart. So God is saying the Egyptian gods may allow you to do all these things, but you're my people now, and I'm jealous over you, and I want you not to commit idolatry. I want you not to commit immorality. That's what the Egyptians do with the false gods, but I'm not like them. I'm a holy God. I'm a righteous God. I'm a just God. That's God, and I'm a Jealous God, would you say amen out there? Our God is a jealous God, would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God called the children of Israel, and now calls us to be morally and spiritually different and worship Him alone as the one true living God and to be a testimony to all of the surrounding nations and people so they too can be converted and saved and also worship God and live holy and righteous and godly lives. Listen to me, beloved. The children of Israel were to be the testimony to the pagans around them. They would have lived such holy, righteous, and godly lives that the, the, the Jebusites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the, everything, the termites, the stalagmites, the stalactites, all the rest of the mites, they'd come along and they'd say, hey, you know what? That's a holy God. I want that God. And God said, that's what we're to be. We ought to be counterculture. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, our God is a God of love. You hear me now. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, uh, 4, 4 that God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the, knowledge of the truth. In 2 Peter 3, 9, he says this. He says that God is not willing that any should perish, but what? All should come to repentance. But our God is also, the Bible says, an awesome God. The Bible says our God is also a jealous God who wants all men to love Him alone, all men to worship Him alone, all men to serve Him alone alone. He says, I am a jealous God and beloved. He says, I want all men to see my holiness and my righteousness. I want all men to see my goodness and my grace and my greatness and my glory. I want all men to see it. And God says, I will not have it. No other gods who are rivals in your life to ever challenge and compete with me. The prophet Isaiah said this. Isaiah said that God said that he would not share his glory with another. Imagine that. When Herod tried it, King Herod, God said he struck him and he died of worms. He was eaten with intestinal worms, intestinal worms from the inside out. So God will not share his glory with you or me. God will not share his glory with Allah. He will not share his glory with Buddha or celebrities or athletes or entertainers or popes. God will not share his uh, glory with presidents or politicians. Nobody, beloved. Our God is unique. Amen. And he says he's a jealous God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, when the children of Israel were at the very base of the mountain, at Mount Sinai, God said this, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu Yehovah Hakad, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and all of thy mind and all of thy might. Jesus confirmed the Shema. That's known as the Shema. That that means listen in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael. Jesus confirms that in the New Testament, but he has, says it like this, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and all of thy might and all of thy mind and all of thy soul and all of thy strength. Amen? That's a lot of olives. I don't mean O olives. <laughs> I mean A-L-L olives. <laughs> okay. Well, beloved, uh, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that how do you see God? I mean, I've, I've asked, I ask people that all the time. And the reason I do is because so many contrive a God that allows them to do whatever they want to do in their life. This God is a God, a, a jolly old grandfather who sits everywhere in the sky. And you see, he judges no one. And he allows everybody to do any iniquity or sin that they want and never have to worry about it. Because God is love. And remember, that's only one aspect of his tar- character. That's not his greatest attribute. What's his greatest attribute? What have I taught you? Holiness. Only the, the cherubim around the throne say to God, you're not love, love, love. They don't say you're mercy, mercy, mercy. Day and night, what do they say? You're holy, 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 holy. holy. Imagine, day and night, since God created the seraphim and the cherubim, They're saying that God is a holy God. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, how do you see God? Oh, hear me now. God very fastidiously guards his holy name and being. God's jealous of his name. Just like you'd be of your, he's jealous of his person, of his being, of his power. God's jealous of his attributes and his uniqueness, beloved. And abusing them brings out his fierce anger and wrath because our God is Jealous God. So the first thing we see is this here, that God is jealous over his person. Number two, God is jealous over his people. Look at verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, And he said, Behold, I will make a covenant. Before all thy people I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among, you, uh, among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed, notice the warning, to thyself. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. I want you to drop down to verses 15 and 16. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. That's idolatry, to eat food sacrificed to idols. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Now, beloved, God never forces us to love and obey or worship him. The scripture teaches us that God gently woos us so that we will. But he warns us that if we don't, he also tells us what will happen if we worship any other God but him. Because whether men know it or they do not know it, the fact of the matter is God is the creator of all men. Amen? Now, God commanded the children of Israel, just like he does us, in the New Testament, to separate from the heathen. Notice what he said to them. He said, don't make a covenant of marriage with them, lest thou they lead you to commit moral and spiritual apostasy and adultery with them with their gods. Beloved, what he's saying is this. God absolutely forbids. Now hear me now. Listen to me, parents. You listen to me, kids. God absolutely forbids missionary dating between a Christian and a non-Christian. The Bible is adamant about that. Now, I know how emotional people get. And I told you, people start dating an unsaved person, and they get emotionally tied to that person, then they can't think right, because passion is stronger than reason. But God absolutely forbids it, because he knows, when you go into the land, don't you ever make a covenant with them, a marriage with them. You're going to start worshiping their gods. And you're going to do it, and you're not even going to know it. And that's going to happen with your kids also. You listen to this preacher now, beloved. 
God knows that the evil and worldly influence of the unsaved person will cause the saved person to compromise their convictions and faith. Ultimately, they'll betray their Lord and they will lose their soul and it is not vice versa. If I have pneumonia, I've told you, and I can't stand up on the chair today, but if I'm a standing up on the chair, it's harder for me to pull you up, uh, and it's, I should say yes, and it's easy for you to pull me down. That's what God is saying. You marry someone, they're going to pull you down from your faith. They're going to pull you down from your convictions. They're going to pull you down to their level. They're going to pull you down to where you were before. The Apostle Paul spoke about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and he's quoting the Old Testament, verses 14 through 16. He says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He says, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? He says, and what communion hath light with darkness? He says, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? He says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and I will into them, and I will be their God, and I will be their people. And beloved, he's quoting out of Exodus. He's quoting out of Leviticus as he's saying that. No missionary dating. I didn't let my kids do it. I don't care how much they pled, cried, kicked, screamed, spit, shout, whatever. You got one shot at going to glory. Amen. You take care of your kids. Never don't. Listen, beloved, don't you love their love so much that you don't do what's right for them? If you really love your child, you're going to do what's right for them. Amen? If I have to shake the fire out of my son to wake him up, I'm going to do it because I don't want him to get hurt. I wouldn't try it today. He tossed me like a salad. <laughs> Just remember we've got those genes, Roy. <laughs> right, Doc? <laughs> you see, beloved, the saved person makes little or no impact on an unsaved person when they are unequally yoked in a relationship. Rarely ever do they convert them. I've been a pastor long enough to see this. Oh, I'm going out with them because I know they will let me talk about the Lord. You know why he's talk, let you talk about the Lord? Because he's thinking, he's scheming. Oh, sure, talk about anything you want. Not with me. And he's scheming, see? You don't care what you talk about, but get hitched. All of a sudden, kids come along. Whoa. Well, wait a minute. I don't belong. I belong to the Wicker Association. I like witchcraft. Well, I'm a Christian. I can't be doing that. Now what? Where do your kids go? Hey, you listen to me now. You marry an unsaved person. Your father-in-law is the devil. That's what we came out of. The Bible said you were all the children of the devil in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Amen? You don't date an unsaved person. You don't let your kids get emotionally affixed or attached to them like that. Because they can... What good... They get the best education, they get the best house, wear the best clothes, eat the best food, and they split hell and open. Our God is a jealous God. I didn't die for you to do that, is what he's saying. Why? Because I'm your creator, I'm your redeemer, I'm your provider, and I'm your protector and deliverer and healer. But most especially, God says, listen to me now, I am your husband. He's my what? The Bible says that Christ is God incarnate is our bridegroom, that we are his body, we are his building, and the Bible says we are his what? Bride. You and I are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we got baptized, we married him, and he becomes our divine, divine spouse. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2, he is jealous over you with a godly jealousy. So, beloved, if God is jealous over you with a godly jealousy, I want to tell you what, you better shape up and fly right. What do you think? You see, beloved, this angrily makes God jealous because he knows that you know better than this. Imagine, parents, you know better than this, and yet you say, well, I love my kids love so much, and I just don't want to have any conflict in the home or whatever. You know what? I, you never stir up dust. You never clean the house without stirring up dust, right? Sometimes you're going to shake a little bit, and then things settle. They can see where you stand, where you are, if, you, if you're able to be intimidated. If you really believe what you believe. So, beloved, unlike our jealousy, God's jealousy is totally selfless. It's his yearning, burning, passionate zeal for our moral and spiritual and physical and eternal welfare and well-being, and not his own. 
Our triune God does not need us, but we need Him. Beloved, the Godhead, listen to me now, is totally self-sufficient. It is self-sustaining. It can eternally exist in infinite glory and joy and bliss, totally apart from you and I, because God is God. He needs nothing. But, beloved, He created us. And He redeemed us. And because of that, he's jealous of our love for him. He's jealous of our affection and our care and our need for him. I'm saying our God is a jealous God. Why? Because he's got so much invested in you. But ever think about it. He bankrupted heaven and sent his only begotten son to shed his sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless blood on the cross to save you from the curse and condemnation of the law and the burning, boiling, bubbling pit of hell. Think about it, beloved. He created you and recreated you in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You're not the same person you used to be, or you shouldn't be, and neither am I, by the way. I remember saying to a person that one time, that I'm not that person that I used to be. The um, person was afraid I was going to rip his head off. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not the person that I used to be. You see, beloved, God has saved and sanctified you. God has made you the temple of the living God, beloved. You're members of the divine family. You're an heir of God, and you're a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder God's so jealous over us. Amen? You see, beloved, we're now his sons and saints. The Bible says we're now his servants and his soldiers and his sheep and his stewards and seekers, beloved. And we now... Uh, possess his very own personal, divine, moral, and spiritual, and eternal DNA inside of us. Now, beloved, God's jealousy is not insecure, but he knows that we'll be lost and insecure without him. I'm saying this, that God's jealous of his commandments. When he tells you not to make a covenant of marriage with an unsaved person, then don't do it. God will be jealous over that. Listen to me now. I'm trying to teach you and help you. If, beloved, God's of his church. God's jealous of his children. The Bible says that we as Christians are the purchased possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What did God pay to purchase us? The Son, the blood of the Son of the living God himself. Amen? That's what it cost God to redeem us from the slave market of sin because he needed perfect blood. So what is it that we do that provokes God to such jealousy and anger? I'll tell you, beloved, when we make gods out of our families and put them before God, God gets jealous. When we make gods out of our spouse and our children and we put them before God, remember Jesus said, if you love me more than father or mother or sister or brother or husband or wife or daughter, you are not worthy of me. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm conveying it. I'm the mouthpiece. Beloved, when we make gods out of our friends or our jobs or our careers or our money or sins, or businesses, or pleasures, whatever it may be, and we put them before God, He gets jealous. Why, beloved? Because He sees now that they're the things that are sitting on the throne of our heart, and they are ruling and reigning over our life, and not Him. And He gets jealous over that. It angers Him. Hey, listen to me now. He's saying, your your spouse didn't die for you. Your kids didn't die for you. Your job didn't die for you. Your money didn't die for you. I did. I tiptoed across the Milky Way and took on human flesh so I could redeem you, so I could save you, so I could clean up your life, so I could bring you into the kingdom of God. Amen. You see, God says, I don't want any idle gods in your life. I don't want any competitors like that in my life. I don't want any co-rivals like that in my life. Like the false gods of the, we read right here, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, I told you, the termites, the cellulites, the stalagmites, like all the ites. These are the kind of gods that the children of Israel saw in the promised land of Canaan where they were going. Oh, hear me now, and don't you miss this. Many have time for TV. Many have all kinds of time for movies and sports and videos. They got all kinds of time for texting. I, if you ever sat at my table, when you were my family, I'll tell you right now, my my wife here? No. Okay. If they ever pulled a phone off the table, I'd have taken it and I'd have smashed it against the wall. That was family time. We, that was holy time. And we joked and we laughed and we had all kinds of time. And I remember one time seeing the Kobe when he was young. Uh, 
I said, Kobe, I says, Christ's Aramaic name is Yeshua. I says, what is it, Kobe? He says, Yeshua. I said, Yeshua. He says, yeah, I'm positive, Dad. <laughs> Yeshua. <laughs> yeah, I'm positive, Dad. <laughs> You see, beloved, we get time for hobbies and we get time for vacations. We get time for uh, travel, many other things. But we got no time for God. We got no time for church. You no time for Bible study or devotions with God or worshiping God. I'm saying that the priorities of our life are out of order and this provokes God to jealousy. And Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10, 22. He said, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than him? Of course we're not. That's fighting a losing battle. I'm not stronger than God, neither are you. So our God is a jealous God, beloved. He's jealous for your devotion to Him and your commitment to Him. He's jealous for your closeness and intimacy with Him. And He's jealous for your feelings and fondness of Him. Our God is a jealous God. I remember years ago, and I love to read biographies. I do it all the time. But I remember reading about Winston Churchill. Remember, you folks remember Winston Churchill during World War II? Winston Churchill, the great Prime Minister of England, was instrumental in winning the battle for Britain against Germany during World War II. The British Army was almost annihilated at Dunkirk, you remember the movie, beloved, and they had been driven back to England. When they went back to England, the British government was in turmoil and had a defeatist attitude, and they didn't know what to do, so they pled with Winston Churchill to capitulate with Germany and accept Hitler's terms of surrender. And these are Winston Churchill's exact words. He said, never. You know what he thought. Never. He said, we shall fight them in the skies. We shall fight them in the seas. We shall fight them in the cities. We shall fight them in the fields. We shall fight them in the battlefronts. But we shall never, ever give up. Well, beloved, now many uh, in the Parliament were both angry and jealous of Winston Churchill, and especially there was one lady official there that was really ticked off at Winston Churchill. And after the British Parliament argued for endless hours about throwing in the towel with Hitler, she just couldn't take it anymore. So here's this stalwart, determined Winston Churchill saying, I shall never, ever give up with Hitler. Never. She said, I had it to hear. So she stands up and she shouts at him, If I were your wife, I'd poison your tea. To which Winston Churchill calmly replied, and I love this. He said, Madam, if I were your husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> if I were your husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this to many Christians get angry and jealous of God because. As with Winston Churchill, neither will he budge or compromise what he's jealous and demands from us. Amen? Because God's jealous of your dedication for him and your allegiance for him and your fidelity to him and for your duty to him. God's jealous for all of that. Well, I just got five minutes, so I'm going to get to point number three. God is jealous over his places. This goes along with what the choir sang today. Look what he says in verses 11 and 24. Observe that which I command thee this day, because I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Drop down to verse 24. For I will cast out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land, when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy uh, God thrice in the year. In other words, there were three mandatory pilgrim feasts, the Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, that Jewish males over 21 were required to go up to Jerusalem to go to. God said, but don't worry about it. When you leave your land, I'll protect it. Nobody will invade you. You'll be able to keep those feasts, because I'm your divine protector. Now, beloved, God had told the children of Israel that he had given them the promised land of uh, Canaan. He said, this is going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Now imagine, beloved, they go into the land, they're going to live in houses they didn't build, they're going to eat from crops they didn't plant, they're going to drink from wells they didn't dig, and everything's right there. It's like you and I just moving into a mansion, and this is pretty good. <laughs> I'll put my feet out, take my clothes, I mean, not take my clothes off, but I'll take my jacket off, and I'll run around with just a smile. <laughs> This was a land flowing with milk and honey. You go in and there's the fig tree, it's blossoming, there's the orange tree, the tangerine trees, watermelon patch, I'd be right there. 
I remember uh, one time when I was a kid, I, I never stole anything in my life. I said, <laughs> and I went over this guy's pants. I said, he'll never see me. And all of a sudden, <laughs> ah! And he <laughs> shot me with his BB gun. As I was trying to lift this watermelon out of the garden. <laughs> I went back with my submachine gun and took care of that later. But uh, No, I'm only kidding. But you see, beloved, although we'd given it to them by grace, and God said, I'm going to give you this land by grace, the fact of the matter is they still had to fight their enemies to occupy every inch of it. God said, here's the land, now go in and get it. What are you saying, Pastor Joel? I'm saying that's known as synergism in theology, meaning the mutual cooperation between the grace of God and the faith of man working together, beloved, so God can work out his will in and for your life. Would you say amen out there? Now, God had told the children of Israel that the inhabitants of the land, listed in verse 11, that they were so morally and spiritually debauched and depraved. They were so morally and corrupt and degenerate. He said that the land itself, later, later on in the text, was going to vomit them out. But God says, I'm going to help you do it. He says, because I'm going to take the children of Israel. I'm going to make you into a super warrior. Five of you or ten of you will fight a hundred. A hundred of you will fight a thousand. And I'm going to be with you. That's where these mighty men of God, the Bible talks about Samson. Samson wasn't walking around like Pastor Joel with all these, mine's like a muscle, like a soggy cheerio. He wasn't walking around like this big man. He was just a little, Rah! when God would come upon him, right? He'd bend steel and take the jawbone of an ass and slay a thousand Philistines. He says, I'm thirsty, God. God said, well, take that same jawbone and drink. <laughs> you can drink water about it. <laughs> He must have went and spit the blood out. But <laughs> you see, when the Spirit of God came on him, he was a mighty man of God, wasn't he? So God, I, God says, I want you to go in there, and, and I want you to know this, that I will divinely protect you. And when you go into the land, he says, you won't have to worry about anybody taking over those land when you come in and you worship me. Now, beloved, listen to me now. As we read the book of Joshua, we see that Israel, who was a ragtag bunch of nobodies, ended up becoming quite an army, didn't they? And the Bible says that they took over the land of Canaan. Now, beloved, under God's divine protection now, they had a homeland. And they had the city of Jerusalem as its capital where they could worship their God and freely keep all of his feasts. And God dwelt in the midst of them in both the tabernacle and in the temple, beloved. Now, listen to me. Wherever God's presence and name is placed, now that becomes, as our choir sang, holy ground. Would you say amen? And he zealously and jealously guards and protects it. So as holy ground, it is to be revered and respected by man. For example, when God's presence appeared to Moses in the burning bush episode on Mount Horeb, God said this to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. And here's Moses looking at that burning bush. He said, take off thy shoes or sandals from off thy feet, for the ground wherein thou standest is holy ground. It isn't holy because it's a different type of dirt. It's holy because my presence is now on that ground. Would you say amen? Oh, bless God. God's presence is here, and this is holy ground. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, in God's presence... And Shekinah glory dwelt in the mobile tabernacle in the wilderness with Israel. God said, this is now holy ground. This isn't just a regular tent anymore. This is holy ground, and I'm a jealous God. The Bible says, when God dwelt in the city of David, which became the Old Testament Mount Zion, and city of Jerusalem, where King Solomon built his temple, and God's Holy Spirit dwelt that most holy place. And the Bible says that the priests couldn't even go into it because the glory of God was so great. God said, this is now holy ground. Would you say amen? And God says, I will jealously protect my holy ground. I'd be afraid, honestly, a, a sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulping, pounding, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again Christian preacher, I'd be afraid to put my hand on him because he'd be holy ground, in God's sight. What do you think? I'd be afraid when God's people returned from their Babylonian captivity and rebuilt the temple in Zion, the city of God, and city of Jerusalem. God said this in Zechariah 8.2, listen. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Notice how God's anger and fury and jealousy are intertwined together. You can't separate them. The New Testament Zion. What's that? The New Jerusalem and the church militant in heaven and the church, uh, excuse me, church triumphant in heaven and the church militant on this earth. The Bible says that that church is the mother of us all in Galatians chapter 4. Amen? Let me close with this. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, a lot of people think it's Paul or Timothy or Apollos. They really do. Uh, some say Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, if it wasn't them, if you're watching Bob Torrance, it was probably Bob Torrance that wrote it. I don't know. But after he just got through describing the writer how God shook Mount Sinai, then he said this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. He says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, he says, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling, which speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood spoke of vengeance. Christ's blood speaks of vindication. Abel's blood spoke of judgment. God's blood spoke of justification. Abel's blood spoke of punishment. Christ's blood speaks of pardon. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, Mount Zion is where God's presence is. It's holy ground. So God's jealous over his church and sanctuary. God's jealous over his person, his people, and his place. Why? Because that's where his presence is, beloved, and he owns both it and us. Wouldn't you say amen? I'm saying our God is a jealous God. Now, the $64,000 question I want to leave you with is this. Are you zealous and jealous for God? When I got up this morning, it was quarter of five. I usually get up early, but now it's so dark, right? And so I, <laughs> now I'll tell you my secret. So I take my underwear on, I hang it on my dresser so I can feel it. I don't want to turn the light on and wake, wake. <laughs> Ellie up, right? <laughs> and so she hears me stumbling around. There's my shirt. There's my thing. Because if you take them and bring them in the, into the bathroom with you, turn the shower on, after the steam hits, it's like this, you know. So kind of, and when I come out, she's got up in the, in the sun's out, noonday. Ellie gets up at the crack of noon. But I remember when I got up this morning, and I was, I was standing in front, I've got a sliding glass door and a deck on my upstairs bedroom window, and I remember looking out, and I said, I quoted Psalm 42, 1 and 2, I said, Lord, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And I quoted Psalm 63, verses uh, one through three in verse eight. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. I said, Lord, make me jealous for you. Our God, is a God who is jealous. Let's go to the throne of grace.